Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. The Iowa History 101 webinar series, which focuses on the past lives of Iowans, continues on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we will explore the multifaceted history of the Surf Ballroom, nationally recognized as the final performance venue of Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and JP, the Big Bopper Richardson. The Surf Ballroom also illustrates the role of small venues in bringing both big name and rising stars to towns across the Midwest. The establishment of touring as a viable tool for promoting musicians and the reality of the 1950s race relations, as well as the beauty of modern architecture and the staying power of this Iowa icon. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Alexa McDowell. Alexa is the owner of AK Consulting and is an architectural historian working in Iowa and in Minnesota for the past 20 years. She specializes in historic tax credits and the National Register nominations. She had the great luck of under, undertaking the research for the nomination of the Surf Ballroom with the nomination completed and the building listed in 2013. With the national significance of the property established by the nomination, the work of preparing the National Historic Landmark nomination began some years later and was completed with the Surf Ballroom's designation as a National Historic Landmark in January of 2021. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Alexa to begin the webinar. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here today. Thank you for taking time out of what I know are busy days to spend a little bit of time talking about this really wonderful special building. I wanted to start to talk just for a minute about uh, National Historic Landmarks. There are often questions about what the difference between a building being on the National Register, and I should say resource because resources embrace buildings, objects, structures, sites, and historic districts. Um, and they are registered. So uh, the in, in Iowa, the National Register of Historic Places represents some 15,000 of those resources um, in the register that completed over a period from the enactment of the National Historic Preservation Act in 66 to the present day. Um, as was noted, the Surf Ballroom was listed on the National Register in 2011. Um, it, opposed to the National Register of Historic Places, the landmark National Historic Landmark registration is um, considerably more um, selective. And the reason for that is any property that's designated as a National Historic Landmark has a proven scholarly based, um, deeply researched case made that there is a national significance in, and that that resource contributes to American history and culture. Um, in comparison with the 15,000 resources that are on the National Register of Historic Places in Iowa, the state has only 27 National Historic Landmarks, including the Surf Ballroom. I've noted just some of them here that I think most of you will recognize. So being uh, numbered among that group is a very significant uh, and important honor. The Surf Ballroom um, is located in Clear, uh, Clear Lake, Iowa, so north central Iowa, immediately west of uh, I-35 interstate running north-south through the state. Originally, the surf was located on the north shore right on the lakefront, 
This photograph here was taken by Safford Locke, who was a longtime newspaper man in Mason City, um, and his collection is held at the uh, Loomis Archives in the Mason City Public Library for any of you that want to do research in Mason City, great collection. At any rate, when you look at this picture here, you see a vacant lot on the um, shorefront. And that's, that location was where the original surf uh, ballroom was constructed in 1933. That building and, the, and its replacement, the present surf, were both designed by Mason City architectural uh, architect Carl Wagner of the firm of Hans, excuse me, Hansen and Wagner. In April of 1947, the original surf, which just uh, by way of uh, kind of getting a picture of it in your head was a mission revival um, in character. So very different than the later surf ballroom. Um, but that building burned in 1947. Immediately after the fire took that building, there was um, input from all fronts uh, locally and regionally that the surf had to be rebuilt. There were local groups like the Rotarians that all got together and um, submitted a letter to the editor, contacted the, the um, owners of the, of the surf ballroom directly and advocated for its uh, being rebuilt. Uh, so it wasn't very long before design plans for, uh, were underway to construct the new surf ballroom. And I never really found any specific evidence of why they chose to build on the site north across North Shore Drive, but I think that this image tells us that a big part of that would have been availability of parking. So this image dates to 1948, and uh, today that site remains pretty much like that with some buildings um, located in isolated corners, um, but the rest of the site beyond the building itself being parking. So it became a very useful um, choice to move it to that larger site. So the surf opened um, on July 1st, 1948, a big grand opening with this advertisement running. I just wanna point out uh, the list of the, um, what the folks were gonna see and do during those days celebrating the grand reopening. And I point that out because this was a period of transi transition from big band music, ballroom dancing, um, and we're on the cusp of some of uh, the early rock and roll to come out. And these dances here tell us that um, we were still in that uh, phase prior to the advent of rock and roll. <clears throat> the National Register nomination spent some time um, and built the case that the architecture of the surf ballroom is significant. And so I wanna spend some time talking about that, but it also helps us um, be able to examine the building and, and, and think about why, why it is that among all of the ballrooms across the country, the surf bears the, the um, status of National Historic Landmark. One of the requirements of a National Historic Landmark is that the building or the resource re retains a excellent level of historic integrity. So when we look at this comparison, we can see that um, that, the, that the surf ballroom remains today very much like it did when it was constructed in 1949. The facade of the building is modernist in character. Some people use the term stream, streamline modern, which typically points to a monolithic facade. So in this case, there was a single color of blonde brick laid with um, thin joints to create a sense of solid mass that had a very elongated form with these lovely curving lines that came up and um, uh, almost joined at the entrance there where the canopy is. Um, that created a very modern form, no fancy stuff, uh, no additive mass, uh, it was all about clean lines. In addition to that, um, we see that the, that the font used for the sign of signage is sans serif. So there aren't any curly cues, it's very straightforward. And the discs adjacent to that establish a motif that is retained today. In addition, the canopy and the uh, elements of the entrance used um, um, steel with a chrome finish, which is very indicative of the 1950s. We'll take a closer look here uh, at some of these elements. 
We can see here that uh, the color of the brick, nice, tight, uh, tightly laid, and it creates that uh, sense of mass in the background with um, that curving form there and the signage retained. This would be on the west side of the main entrance. Some of the alterations that we see here have really have to do with modernizing the landscape as a way of uh, incorporating um, memorial things into the experience for visitors who come there. What you see there are benches that people have donated and they did add their um, lovely National Register uh, bronze plaque to com commemorate that designation. This is a nice view of the entrance. The, on the left, we have the canopy, and again, it has a steel with a chrome finish. The marquee that surmounts the, the canopy actually dates to just a couple years after the building was completed and placed in service. Then we have these, this great curvilinear centralized uh, ticket booth with flanking double leaf doors. Um, and those, I think you can see, have Bakelite handles which was a, a early um, dense uh, hard plastic. This is a nice view. I just like this picture, so I hope you like it too. Um, standing inside the ticket booth and looking out. Um, I don't know how I did that. Sorry about that. Um, looking out across the street. So everything behind that modernist facade is all um, design that's function driven. So if we stand in the parking lot and look to the northwest or the northeast and, or, pardon me, south, southeast and southwest, we see only function-driven design. So obviously that barrel, wall, wall, barrel roof marks the location of the dance floor. Um, the flat roof uh, adjacent to the barrel are all of those um, areas that support the, the primary function of the dance floor. So the seating are in the flat areas, the adjacent or um, cafe is in um, with that flat area. So the modern design is, uh, is relegated to the facade, the most important um, view of the building and all design, uh, function driven design from the rear. So the surf today um, reflects a historic rehabilitation that was undertaken in 1994 and ongoing maintenance and upkeep um, from that time. The interior original to the design was a beach motif and that has been maintained and actually in the 1994 rehabilitation, much of many features, original features that had either been uh, covered over or um, stored someplace else were returned to the building. In addition to that, the, they have expanded their mission to um, include a museum that focuses on all of the uh, musical performance performers who have appeared at the surf ballroom with particular attention to those that are associated with um, the winter dance party of 1959. Um, and so they have done a lovely job, um, very professional um, putting together displays to help us understand the importance of music um, and of the venue itself. So let's take a quick look at some of the before or afters of the interior and think about that uh, beach motif as we walk through here. So this is the entrance vestibule between the ticket booth and the interior lobby. You can see in this view that the trellis uh, over the um, on the ceiling gives us that initial sort of transitional space um, from a from a an exterior to an interior of a beach motif. Um, the only element that has been removed from this view since the building was constructed is the driftwood sculpture that surmounts the lintel over the doors. Otherwise, it's intact. The lobby prom pro, uh, promenades were looking um, from the entrance toward the ballroom. And the, on the left, we have a little bit different angle there and we can see the um, coat uh, check-in area on the left. There was a second one on the opposite side of the corridor that was removed in order to reconfigure um, a section of that floor plan in order to enhance the new uh, kind of expanded functions, which include a small gift shop and an office. 
But also in this view, we can see the stenciling on the walls. Those, um, that, that stenciling was redone in 1994 with rehabilitation. And then it was done, redone again, that must be almost three years ago now to a color scheme that was much more um, in keeping with, um, with what we can understand about tonality in the black and white image. It was done by a professional who created a stencil and then they're able to keep it and um, have it part of the archive and also for reuse as necessary in the future. The, the carpet um, has been replaced a couple times in 90, 1994 and then again in the last five years. And they're not, it's not a replica, but you can see that the character, um, that care was taken to be sure that the character was very much uh, like that of the original. Here we're looking at the ball road and promenade. So to the right, we have an opening into the lobby and at the left would be the um, dance floor. Again, you can see that the elements of the 1949 are retained intact, including ceiling finishes, floor finishes, wall finishes, some lattice work that marks the entrance into the lobby, the knee walls that separate the uh, promenade from the dance floor. Um, when I look at these, I, you know, I, I'm also experiencing being in the space um, when I'm thinking about it. And so I'm going to say now, and I'm sure I'll say again, the best way to really understand um, how, how this building has stayed the same and how it feels is to go there. This is the dance floor. So we have um, dancers in 1949, and then we have a view from 2020. Um, the, the, building retains its original dance floor. It's been sanded and repaired, um, but it is the original dance floor laid in a Lincoln log um, pattern. The stage is retained, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in the next slide, but um, otherwise the, um, the space remains much as it did. So let's talk about the stage. So as you can imagine, when Buddy Holly with his, and the crickets, which you know are a total of four people um, with their equipment, were performing on this stage, the image at the right, where there's a curved line there, they would have fit on that stage. Um, in the years subsequent to the 1950s, as equipment got bigger, bands got bigger, it became necessary to expand the stage. So the the wonderful thing is is that the original stage was retained and added onto, and then added onto again. So the advantage to that is we still can understand looking at this image where the edge of the original stage was. We can see that it, that it increased. And in addition to that, the dance floor that um, is now encumbered by the stage is still underneath the stage. So if those additions uh, to the stage were taken back, we'd still have the full dance floor. I'll also point out in, in this, um, these images that the, um, the curtains for the stage were replaced using historic photographs in 1994. Also that the palm trees on either side and there's some chairs there. Um, I believe that the chairs are actually original but, but they, were they were put back in the places where they belonged using historic images. This is the seating area. Um, and this is a really great place to really be able to see that beach motif where we have the, a, can, a striped canopy that stretches, it's painted, it's a faux, it's a trompe l'oeil um, that stretches across the ceiling toward the outside edge of the space, then drops to create that scalloped edge of a canopy so that the people sitting in the booths had a sense that they were looking out at the ocean. These murals were um, covered over and then um, relieved of that covering in 1994. And um, they really add so much to um, the character of that beach motif. Here we have a lovely picture of this family sitting and, <clears throat> and enjoying a performance. Um, all of the booth seating are original. Um, I will tell you from personal experience that I, myself could not fit in there with um, five other people, um, which just uh, is, is uh, another affirmation that we're bigger than we used to be. But their wonderful seating and people, um, people are very pleased to be able to get a seat and to enjoy this because it's part of the experience. But this view on the right, where you really get a great 
sense of looking out at the ocean scene, feeling like you're under a canopy. And then I'll also point out the um, stenciling on the end of those benches, which is an undersea scene with uh, fish and uh, bubbles rising to the surface. This is the Surfside 6. So this is adjacent uh, on the east. So it's part of the building. I don't want to confuse how I'm saying that. You enter into this space from the ballroom and from the lobby. And this is one space that's been, was altered in the 60s. Um, two openings were cut into that south wall to allow sliding glass doors to be placed there so that people could go out onto a patio. But um, they did a, a wonderful job of not interfering with that canopy, which continues to hang down over the toward the opening. And um, there are canted piers there that, that remained in place. So um, even though it's an alteration to that wall, it's a minimal alteration. The other thing that was changed was that the bar in this image, and I've got another one on the next slide to, to show a little bit better, um, was shortened so that they could uh, introduce a kitchen um, at one end. So here you can see it, but otherwise it maintains its um, that undulating canopy, um, curved corner, very modern in character. So, this is my chance to reiterate, if you haven't seen the surf ballroom and you're intrigued by its character and uh, the, really the way to, to understand it is, sorry, is to go see it. Sorry about that. So um, this is just one more view to help understand really it's lovely uh, modernist architecture and uh, high level of historic integrity. So rock and roll at the surf ballroom. As I noted, the uh, 1948 and into the early 50s is really the front cusp of the rise of rock and roll. I'm not a music theorist. I'm not a music uh, specialist. I lack the deep understanding that many musicians have and, and being able to understand the nuances and the very complex overlapping between influences that musicians were listened to. The stories that, that I know that I keep in my head are Buddy Holly and other people like him sitting in their cars at places where they knew that radio signals were very strong and listening to music from all over the country, that they were hearing the music coming out of Detroit, um, what then was referred to race music. They were influenced by the music that was around them. In Buddy Holly's case, he was a Texan. And so he was listening to rockabilly and to the blues. And the, they were playing with those things. They were experimenting. They were trying to find their own way. And that was what rock and roll um, was about. It was how rock and roll became um, so relatable to so many people was because all of these influences became rolled into it and it and it spoke to them. So Buddy Holly, um, Richie Valens and the Big Bopper are the three rock and roll artists that are most um, intimately and emotionally and spiritually connected with the story of the surf ballroom. So I'm going to take a minute to talk about each one of them. As I mentioned, Buddy Holly was born in Lubbock, Texas as Charles Harden Holly. And just to answer the question, the E was dropped by accident and he became Holly without an E. Um, he very early, when he was in junior high school, started a two-man duo called Bob and Buddy. They played on the local radio station. And then um, later they added Larry Wellborn on the uh, uh, bass viol and they became the three tunes. They were doing all kinds of, they were writing some things. They were doing a lot of rock, rockabilly. They were um, sitting in their car, listening to the music, being um, pumped in from different places in the country. And then they were on in on the back in the backstage of a performance, um, and Elvis Presley was on stage. That was 1955, and and after that, Buddy Col Buddy Holly stated that that was the performance that made him see um, the direction that he wanted to go. And at that time, Buddy Holly and the Crickets were born. The, um, the the composition of the Crickets changed a couple times, but initially. 
Um, it was made up of Jerry Allison, Nikki Sullivan, and Joe B. Maudlin. Um, they really got things rolling when they began to work with Richie, Richard Petty, Petty, who had a studio in Clovis, New Mexico. It's about 100 miles from Lubbock. Um, and Richard Petty was um, an innovator, and um, he worked in a way that allowed Buddy Holly to be very um, inventive. They would go and they would spend hours overnight. Um, there was a stu an apartment at the studio and they would spend hours and hours playing with one song. Um, and it was that freedom of experimentation that's credited with um, how things went for Buddy Holly and the Crickets, the kind of music that came out, his ability to take those um, early influences with that, um, his invigorated sense of uh, rhythm and, and energy that came from Elvis Presley and to be successful. And I'll also say that um, if anybody has a chance to go to Petty Studio in Clovis, it's a remarkable experience. Richie Valens was only 17 years old in 1959. He was a um, California boy. Um, not a trained musician, he was self-taught. He brought his um, Mexican heritage into his music. Um, he was overlooked in many ways for a long time, but um, in, in more recent years, he's been, he got a lot of attention in his um, role of, of mixing Latin music, his own heritage with rock and roll. By the time he was on the winter dance party, he had um, his song Donna and La Bamba on um, running up the charts. La Bamba was particularly important because he had adapted what was a Mexican wedding song, a very traditional um, folk music into a rock ballad. And it was a highly successful record. Um, and then again, it was re-released when the movie came out um, in the 90s, uh, La Bamba, um, and was a big hit for Los Lobos. JP the Big Bopper Richardson was a radio man. He was one of those guys that was full of energy. I can I, I had a friend that was a radio guy and, and I always imagined Bill's voice um, full of energy, very hyped and um, excited. And that was, I always think of the Big Bopper in that way too. And part of that was because I remember as a child, the song Chantilly Lace. That was his big song and his personality and how he performed on stage was really what um, made him popular with people. Um, in addition to that, he, he did write music, he did sing, and um, he promoted in other um, areas as well. Um, I've heard you know, mul multiple music historians refer to him as a novelty act. And I think that of the three performers that we're discussing, he certainly was, um, was the was the one that would fall into that category. There was much more um, sense of loss in terms of what would have what might have been with Richie Valens and um, Buddy Holly. I'll also um, throw out there right now. He was only 27 years old. As I mentioned, Richie was 17. Buddy Holly was only 23. I want to talk a minute about the civil rights. I mean, we. We know um, how, how um, race discrimination um, impacted so many different aspects of our culture in, in the 50s and after. And the surf ballroom was um, not free of that struggle. Um, this is a picture of um, Mr. Bennett and his date. In uh, 1952, there were two separate cases um, brought against Carol Anderson, who was the manager of the surf ballroom for being denied access to the surf ballroom. Mr. Bennett had bought tickets and purchased tickets to see Louis Armstrong. He and his girlfriend had the tickets, but when they went to um, enter the ballroom, they were denied access by the um, doorman. Then um, at about the same time, there was another man, Isidore Patterson Jr., who had attended, um, they called it a, a barn, oh, a square dance demonstration with a group of people from his business. There, he was uh, one of two black men who were denied access. So these cases were um, brought um, against, as I noted, uh, the surf ballroom. Um, Patterson's was tried first. And the question was whether or not 
this um, lack of access to the surf ballroom was a violation of the Iowa Civil Rights Act. The Civil Iowa Civil Rights Act was enacted in 1884, so it was a long-standing act. Um, the, the at issue is this specific piece that I have written out here, and the point of contention was: Is a ballroom considered at, um, under the all other places of amusement? And um, the the um, the, de the defendant, uh, defending attorney made the case that because the Iowa Civil Rights Act does not state specifically or define a ballroom specifically as an other place of amusement, it could not be considered a place of amusement. And in addition to that, the Iowa Supreme Court had not taken up the issue. So as a result, um, that both of those, well, the, the um, first case, Bennett's case was lost and the second one, the Patterson case was lost and the Bennett case was never tried. The good news was that this, these, this case um, and this issue, the question about place of amusement then laid the foundation for the next case. So is a ballroom a place of amusement then became, um, the, the big question and the question that had to be answered. In April of 1953, um, LaFon Amos filed a suit um, charging with the federal court, charging that she was denied admission to the surf on December 8th of 1951 because of her race. Um, I wanna, you know, when I, when I think about these things, I always go, how, how is it that, that, that they defended this, right? What was, what was the question? How was it that, that the people, that, that owners of the surf or the employees of the surf stated that there was a reason to keep um, black people out of their facility? And this is the one that just stuck in my craw, which was that their official policy was that any person admitted must be acceptable as a dancing partner to all other patrons. Well, I don't like plaid. So if someone that wore plaid couldn't go in and then he, that person wouldn't be acceptable to me as a dancing partner, you know, the theory is they couldn't be admitted, right? But we all know what they were saying. Um, and it, it, it's sometimes these things are, they slap you in the face. It's a, it's a shock, but it was a reality and it was a reality that was dealt with. So the case, um, uh, Mrs. Amos's case was won. And the reason that it was won was that it was ruled that the ballroom is a place of amusement. It was a very important um, finding um, it set the, the stage, prevented any other people trying to circumvent that terminology from being able to do that. They were no longer able to hide behind this idea that the ballroom wasn't a place of amusement and, and to then justify discrimination based on that. Um, uh, newspapers in Des Moines certainly discussed the importance of the Came Amos case and really felt as though that was um, setting a tone for um, other things that were happening in the state at the same time. Um, those are the cases that I am aware of. And I will say, because I think it's important to put out there that I, I'm certain there were other cases. Certainly there were cases that were never brought to trial, no issue was made of. Um, and so um, this is, is only the things that we understand at this point in time. The Winter Dance Party. So the case for significance for the National Historic Landmark designation had in large part to do with the idea that the creation of the Winter Dance Party as a business model, um, that, the, that the Winter Dance Party of which the surf ballroom was the last um, stop for those three musicians um, was significant. It changed the business model. It allowed promoters and music businessmen um, a new avenue um, for um, making money. So they put together these um, dance party tours that traveled um, lots of times. They were set up on the East Coast. 
And um, they would travel night after night, have a group of musicians who performed together. They were promoted all the way along the line. They sold stuff, the radio stations promoted it so that records sold for the, new, um, the, the promoters. Um, new musicians were interested, uh, uh, performers were introduced into these tours so that um, there was an, a chance to promote their music down the line. So it was a really important new type of money-making um, avenue, right? The revenue stream. This map on the right is the original Winter Dance Party tour. So it was, I, I wanted to see this because you can see how much um, was scheduled, but also that for many years, I did not realize that the tour was this long because in my head, it stopped in Clear Lake. Um, at the surf ballroom, but in fact, it went on for some time after the um, February 2nd death of the three, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. The Winter Dance Party was an example of this new um, sort of business model, but it was different in that it was organized specifically for Buddy Holly at a point in his career where he was in money troubles. He had split with um, Norman Petty. There was a lot of fighting about who owned what and who got money for what, and he was in a bad way. He was living in New York City, and his friend Erwin Feld, who was a promoter, did lots of these um, large-scale dance, uh, dance party tours, um, organized this one specifically for Buddy, and, and that in part created the problem because it was it was organized quickly. It was organized sloppily. The schedule was crazy. This is the route here, in, 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 the isolated part in the um, leading up to the February 2nd date. You can see they went all over the place. I don't even know. That's not a trapezoid quite, but, um, but anyway, it, you can see visually that it was a wild schedule. Um, and it was the height of the winter uh, weather season in the Midwest. So from the beginning, um, disaster was uh, clearly ahead. Um, we don't have time to go through all those stops. I'll tell you that there's a book out there that's called um, The Day the Music Died by Larry Lehman. And he does a really wonderful job of talking through um, all of the venues um, there's great information about, about um, not only the, the buildings and the facilities, but the people who came, how they greeted the, the different musicians, which is very interesting. Um, and so I would certainly recommend that as a resource if you're interested in knowing more about the specifics of the Winter Dance Party. To synopsize it, in addition to it just being a disaster um, from start to finish, they were faced with record low temperatures, record high snow totals, um, buses that broke down, heating units that didn't work. Um, Carl Bunch, who was part of the reconstituted cricket, the crickets that were brought back together just for the winter dance party, um, ended up with um, frostbite on his fingers. And as a drummer, that was the end of it for him and he was hospitalized. So by the time the winter dance party got to Clear Lake in the, uh, the surf ballroom on February 2nd. They were a miserable crew. Um, both Buddy, Buddy um, pardon me, both Richie Valens and the Big Bopper were sick. Um, Richie Valens was a Californian and he had come to do the winter dance party without even a heavy coat. Um, and those of us from Iowa, the Midwest, certainly know what a mistake that would be. So they get there, they're exhausted, and that sets up, sets the stage for um, what we know to be a great disaster. So at the end of the performance, Buddy Holly had arranged for an airplane to transport he, Waylon Jennings, and Tommy Alsop uh, to their next stop, next stop in Moorhead, Minnesota. There um, was some exchange um, about who was going to go because of uh, the fact that that um, Jay, uh, excuse me, the Big Bopper and Richie were both ill, and as a result, those two ended up being on the plane uh, with Buddy Holly. They chartered a plane um, piloted by a young 21-year-old man um, by the name of Peterson, Roger Peterson, and um, bad weather led to a crash on a, in a field outside of Clear Lake to the north. 
Um, that site crash is now a memorial and has stayed that way for uh, many years. People come all over the country to visit the crash site. So the legacy of the surf ballroom, um, to me, it's uh, long and, and important. In 1978, um, the winter dance party as an annual celebration was reconstituted. Um, from that time, with the exception of maybe 1994 and then last year because of COVID, they have had a winter dance celebration every year. And um, in recent years, um, the years that I have been involved with the surf ballroom, it's a, it's a four day event. People come from England and Australia and all over the country. There are different kinds of bands. They bring back um, um, some of the bands that played at the time that Buddy Holly and um, some of these early rock and rollers were playing. I saw Jerry Lee Lewis, for example. Um, really fun time, lots of dancing. They do all kinds of special events. And so that's really helped keep people engaged and interested in the surf. And of course, as we lose those early musicians, um, how they handle that has changed. For example, Tommy Alsop, who played that night um, with Buddy Holly, passed away recently, and now his son has been um, stepping into his shoes. And so they've adjusted to that, um, but it, become, it, it remains vital um, and a very important part of the Surf Ballroom's annual um, schedule. Um, I noted that in 1994, the, um, the building was purchased. Uh, Dean and Joanne Snyder were local folks, um, have a construction company, and Dean Snyder and his wife loved to dance at the surf ballroom. And when the surf was um, at some risk, um, Dean bought the surf ballroom for Joanne. And I was um, fortunate enough to get to meet him and to interview him when I was working on the National Register nomination. And um, he told me, and he has told many, that the reason that he bought the surf ballroom was because Joanne loved to dance and that if she had loved to fish, he would have bought her a fishing rod. So I, for one, am very grateful she didn't like to fish, she liked to dance. Um, as a result of that, the surf remains um, for all of us to enjoy. In the years after that, the, um, a foundation has been uh, established which um, protects and um, uh, promotes the surf ballroom. Um, in addition to that, I noted that they have um, expanded their um, um, museum facilities so that people can come and learn a great deal about um, the history of rock and roll and of those three performers in particular. Um, and more recently, they have developed an outreach program that uh, includes teaching uh, music classes. I wanted you to see this as, as I noted, they continue to honor Buddy Ritchie and the Big Bopper. The, this is one particular display in the Surfside Six. Um, I apologize, the flash um, makes it a little difficult to see some of them, but I will tell you that um, many of these items were do donated um, either gifted or on loan from the families of the three um, performers. Um, Richie Valens' sister, Connie Valens, remains very um, engaged in what goes on at the surf and has been super helpful in um, maintaining her, um, and promoting his legacy. Very, uh, she's been an important part of that. Um, and about five years ago, um, a block to the west of the surf, um, they built this um, memorial to the three uh, performers. You can go and visit that, of course, it's quite lovely. So to wrap up, um, before we take questions, I just want to um, thank again, Dean and Joanne Snyder, who gave us a gift that um, is really so important. Um, and their children and um, larger family continue to protect and to, to promote and um, maintain and uh, love that facility. The North Iowa Central uh, Center and Museum Board of Directors, they're the folks uh, foundation who devote their uh, time uh, toward its ongoing uh, preservation. Lori Leitz is the executive director. Um, she is one of the most dedicated, creative, 
organized, um, kind people I've ever met in my life. And she is the glue in that building. Um, I'd also like to thank the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Historic Landmark Program. The reviewers and staff there um, provided really critical guidance and feedback to me as I was doing both the National Register nomination and the National Historic Landmark Program nomination. And finally, um, I'm grateful to the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs for this History 101 uh, series. I think it, it uh, does such important work bringing um, information to us um, at a time in particular where it's not necessarily uh, easy to get at those things. So thank you for that. So with that, I will um, take whatever questions or comments you'd like to uh, offer up. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Alexa. Uh, we have a few questions to ask. Um, however, before I pose our first question, I want to remind our participants, you can still submit your questions through our Q&A feature. Uh, we're on a schedule though, so please note we may not be able to get to all the questions. But here's our first one, and this is in reference to a poster that was shown in your presentation. But did Dion and the Belmonts perform the night of February 2nd? Did they perform? Yes, they did. Okay, and, sure. and, and I'll just add to that, that, that after the second, the tour did continue. And, um, and Dion and the Belmonts went on to tour the rest of the, uh, the rest of that uh, winter dance party. And um, sorry, I got distracted because I'm trying to show you my face, but I can't find my that part. So you're going to have to do without my face. Um, which is probably just as well. But let me just say, so Dion the Belmonts did, and they went on and had a, a successful career. They finished the winter dance party. And one of the things that Dion wrote a book, um, which is also very interesting because it talks in a very personal way about how we felt about that particular event and his relationship in a particular with Richie Valens, who everybody kind of protected and big brothered. Um, but he talked about how difficult it was for, for him and the other survivors to, to go and finish the rest of the winter dance party, which had, oh, I don't know, it must have been 12, yeah, 12 more um, venues to complete after that. Um, and so along with Dion, they pulled in, um, oh, I'm going to forget his name, um, Richie Valeen who out of uh, Fargo, North Dakota and some other performers to help uh, Dion and the Belmonts round out that, um, the bill so that they could finish. So, um, but do check out his book because it's very interesting. Uh, in your research, did you find any photographs of the original building that burned down? Yes, there are photographs. Um, and if someone wants those, they can be in touch with me and I'll send them, but also um, the, um, that would be something that will be at the Loomis Archives at Mason City that I mentioned before. But yes, those are certainly available. Perfect. Uh, so a question about the National Historic Landmark Program. Can you give a quick summary of the program and how did the building or location get selected? How did the build, say the last part again, please? Uh, yeah, how does a building or location get selected? So when a National Register nomination is submitted on a property, like at the SURF, um, the person writing the nomination um, designates whether or not the building is locally significant, state significant, or nationally significant. Because the SURF ballroom, the case was made that it was nas nationally significant in association with as the final performance venue of Buddy Ritchie and the Big Bopper, then the, there's a kind of automatic trigger that the National, his, his, the National Historic Landmark review folks take a look at that and say, do we think it might be eligible for the National Historic Landmark program? If that's the case, then a decision is made uh, whether or not to move ahead with it. The, um, this, this project moved ahead as a National Historic Landmark be, uh, due to the, uh, um, the availability or the applic success, successful application for a historic resource development grant, which um, allowed the SURF to go ahead and do the work that was required of the nomination. Thank Does you that answer the question? That's a great answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And actually continuing that topic, uh, does National Historic Landmark status include requirements for government design review before major real, re, I can't, forgive me, major rehabilitation can occur? 
the, the National Historic Landmark Program um, does elevate the, I don't like the word scrutiny, but, but the, the care that's taken for historic re rehabilitation of those, pro, of those properties. My experience with the surf is they've, they recently in the last year and a half had to replace their roof. And, and we, you, we did a historic tax credit project. Um, and so we did go through that process, which involves a review of the work that's gonna be do, done. Simultaneously, it opens up other resources um, national that, that are only available to National Historic Landmarks. And so the SURF has been able to tap into some funds that are only available to that level of a resource for things like repair of the dance floor. So it's been a great benefit to them um, in that way in particular. During uh, your presentation, you talked about civil rights. How does architecture lend itself to better understand civil rights, like the SURF ballroom and the Edna Griffith building in Des Moines? Well, um, I think it's. I think that it. I think that many of us learn about um, things that we don't understand personally because we put ourselves into a space to better understand it. Right. So I can. I can be at the surf ballroom and know the things that I know about it, and then. And then add the important layer of race discrimination and, and be able to be more empathetic, to be able to understand better what that might have, must have felt like at that moment and, and the responsibility that we have now to do something about it. You mentioned the Edna Griffin building, um, that's in downtown Des Moines, and that was another project or a, a, another example of a civil rights case that, that tested the Iowa Civil Rights Act. This one in 1948, when Edna Griffin um, staged a sit-in and a protest at the Katz Drugstore, which was on the first floor of that building. And as a result of that, um, Katz was forced to desegregate and to serve um, regardless of race. And so those two buildings in our state are two that I'm familiar with that help us illustrate those particular challenges uh, the outcome of those, and to also not, um, they're, they're a physical reminder that we need to do more. And it's our last question. Um, as our connections to these performers and events pass in the history, how do we sustain the public interest in them? Like for example, the John Wayne Museum in Winterset, as well as other examples nationwide. Well, you know, that that is a challenge. And, you know, I mentioned the fact that, um, that for so many years, the Winter Dance Party has been able to bring um, musicians to perform at the Winter Dance Party that were of the era of Buddy Holly. We're losing those musicians. And, and, and so I do have a level of concern about um, how do you make that transition from um, the people of that period to the people who are not of that period and not lose that direct connection. One thing I think that's helped is there is a, um, a cover group, John Muller, who does, um, who does all Buddy Holly stuff. And if anybody's seen him, he's really great. So those groups that are contemporary groups who, who impersonate the music um, and, and the characters that did that a specific music, I think that helps, but it's, it's a forever challenge. Um, and um, I think that the surf is certainly aware of that and working to find other ways to connect and to bring new people into, um, into that history, the life of that history. And with that answer, we'll close up the webinar. Thank you again, Alexa. This has been a very informative lunch. You're very welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Also, thank you to everyone joining us today. We hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. Now, there are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of their other fantastic digital programs, such as our Goldies Kids Club activities for young historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. 
Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you here again Thursday, May 27th for our next Iowa History 101 webinar. Thank you, everyone.